Hello, and welcome to today's uh, webinar session. My name is Gil Min, and I am a technical manager at Park Systems. I will be your host and moderator for today's event. Um, today, we have uh, Ben Shonick speaking about Kelvin Pro Force Microscopy. Uh, a little bit about our format for today's session. Today's session is scheduled for 30 minutes uh, with some time for Q and questions and answers at the end of, of the presentation. Uh, you should see a question box, so feel free to enter any questions during uh, the presentation into this field, and we'll address them uh, at the end of the talk. Today's session will be recorded and be made uh, available later through our website. And so, let's see if I can come over. For those of you who are not familiar with Park Systems, a little background, uh, we're a leading manufacturer of atomic force microscopes. Uh, for both industrial, academic, and R&D labs. Uh, our global headquarters is based in Suwon, Korea, but we have locations across uh, the world. So we have uh, in North America, our headquarters is based out of Santa Clara, California, and we have regional offices in Mexico City and Albany, New York. Um, if you're not familiar with atomic force microscopy, uh, it has a wide range of applications, um, everything from uh, typical material characterization to emerging bioscientific uh, measurements. Uh, a popular application for us is often in semiconductor characterization or looking at novel devices such as 2D materials, uh, battery research materials, or doing uh, nanofabrication and nano manipulation. Uh, if you're not familiar with the product line, I invite you to visit our website. We really have uh, two product line branches. One, uh, AFM's lineups targeted for R&D environments. So this is our research AFM's. These are targeted for small samples up to about uh, 300 millimeters or so. And they have a various, uh, various environmental uh, conditions. So we can actually image in ambient conditions and fluid under high vacuum. And then we also have uh, specialized AFMs for the research systems that are integrated with, for example, an inverted light microscope. So that's our NX12. We also have a fully automated lineup uh, targeted for industrial metrology and defect inspection. Uh, these AFMs are designed for full automation, everything from sample handling to automatic tip exchange. And these AFMs are developed uh, and, and, and designed to run 24, seven days a week, right? At this point, I'd like to invite uh, to uh, introduce our speaker for today. Today's speaker is Ben Shonick. Uh, ben is a senior technical service engineer at Park Systems, uh, where he focuses on service and support for our research AFMs. Today's talk is entitled uh, Sideband Kelvin Probe Force Microscopy for Advanced Materials. And Ben has been with Park for four years. Uh, ben has degrees in physics from Auburn University and Kenyon University. At this point, I'll hand it over to Ben. All right, thank you, Gil. Um, you should all see my screen now. So as Gil mentioned, I'm a senior technical services engineer at Park Systems. Um, I hope that today's talk will be insightful for you. And um, let's begin. So um, Gil has already given us our introduction to Park Systems. Um, as we go into this, the subject of this talk is Kelvin force probe microscopy and specifically sideband technique. Um, to do that, we have to go quite a few layers deep into the technique itself and to basically jump to the end, which is where the uh, main components of this talk um, exist. However, um, for advanced materials characterization, I've included several um, slides throughout that should show examples of imaging and how you might use this technique um, for your own research, et cetera, and what the advantages are. And there will be a bit of mathematics, but um, I apologize a little bit in advance for that. Um, but we're, to really understand what's going on, we really have to go pretty deep with this technique. So as Gil mentioned, um, we have two different product lines, our research um, baseline, um, it's some of our industrial tools. Um, we can do all kinds of things with um, atomic force microscopy, especially when it comes to electrical characterization. So such as what we'll cover today is EFM or electric force microscopy, Kelvin force probe, which would be the actual potential uh, charge distribution at the surface. But you can also measure items such as current or piezo force, et cetera. And many of those are all listed here today. But as mentioned today, we're gonna to be focusing on electric force microscopy um, as a quick background, and then we'll jump very deeply into Kelvin probe. If you have experience with AFM, um, this will get a little more advanced towards the end. If you've never seen AFM or what an AFM can do um, when measuring potential charge distribution, I hope this is insightful and um, hopefully I can take you along with me. Um, I will be covering from the ground up as much as best as I can. 
so to begin um, the first thing um, with an AFM is that we always measure topography and that's measured as an atomic interaction between the AFM cantilever and the sample now this is a very short range force and it is nowhere near as strong as the electrostatic interaction so first and foremost we have to understand that whenever we do an electric measurement we have to fight this much stronger force when we measure this force, we measure the direction, the strength of the force, and we can use these two in combination with each other um, through various techniques that you'll see here to determine basically where the potential charge distribution is, as well as its whether it's positive or negative, et cetera. So what does this look like um, from a physics background? I like to show this here. So we measure two things, the EFM amplitude and the EFM phase, specifically for EFM or electric force microscopy. The EFM amplitude is always positive, and then we use the phase itself to determine if it's positive or negative. Now, why Kelvin force probe and why not stick with just electric force microscopy? That's because the phase itself, as you can see below, is dependent on basically what part of the waveform you'll lock into. We'll look at this in a lot more detail in the upcoming slides but the actual strength of it is not dependent on whether or not it's positive or negative. So to have a reference, you either have to scan something that you know is positive in a region and compare, or you use Kelvin force probe, which will apply a DC bias to the tip and we can measure the actual potential. So that's what the need that drove um, Kelvin force probe along with measuring the work function. Originally this was done, as mentioned, the electric force is much stronger by two pass imaging. So the first pass would measure the topography, which is what AFM does first and foremost, and is the foundation for any of these measurements. And then we add something on, which is the electric measurement. So in the case of two pass, you would scan over the surface, measure your topography, then come back, then repeat that same motion and measure the electric. The issue with this is that now your image takes twice as long. So from there, we use a piece of technology which we're going to be focusing on. So as I mentioned, we're kind of going um, very in detail into a very specific component of this for sideband KPFM, which means that we have to focus on this lower lock and amplifier loop that we're talking about now. So to do one pass imaging or to take the electric um, information and the topography information at the same time, we use a piece of equipment known as a lock and amplifier. Lock and amplifier, I'll talk about that in a second, but it allows us to basically measure not only the topography, but also the electric information by separating the two signals from each other as we pass over. So we've taken care of the issue of our image takes twice as long because we can gather both information at the same time. So how does this work? A lock and amplifier is a system that basically uses constructive or destructive interference of a waveform. If it is out of phase, it will cancel, in phase it can amplify. This means that you can drive or measure a driven signal to the system and lock onto it and effectively pull a signal out of another one. In the case of electric based measurements or amplitude modulated KPFM, we use the first amplifier to drive the topography measurement to measure that signal to measure the height of the sample. Then we use the second one to not only drive an AC bias to a conductive cantilever, but to also measure the electrical signal as well and separate it. So when you do this, um, here well, we start with the math. So we generally model the, and I'll explain this a little bit further in more detail, um, the cantilever and the sample interaction, which must both be conductive. Um, we model them as a capacitor. So as you can see here, um, I've split up this equation. We'll see this again um, in a larger scale in case it's a little small, but you have three terms. You have the A term, the B term, and the C term. Basically, we have a static term or a DC term. You have a cross term, which is what we will be most likely focusing on. That is at a frequency omega. And then we have a secondary signal, which is at the two omega. The two omega contains only the capacitance terms. The omega term contains the surface and the capacitance. This is mainly what we're going to focus on first. And this is where all the detail is going. So just to recap, we started with a topography measurement. We're measuring a deflection of a cantilever based on an electric force. We're able to gather both the electric and the topography in one pass, and we're able to do this with a lock and amplifier. The next thing we do for Kelvin force probe, as I mentioned briefly, is now we're going to apply a DC bias to the tip itself to cancel out 
the B term. So if you look in the center of it, you see two times the capacitance divided by the distance, and then you have the DC term of the sample and the, um, the cantilever itself. If we match those, that term goes to zero. And we'll see this again, I'll go back over this, but um, that is mainly where we're gonna get our information. This is known as amplitude modulated Kelvin force probe. And it tells us not only the, the actual potential distribution, and it has the information that we need about whether or not a surface is positively charged or negatively charged without having to look at the phase. So as mentioned, we saw this before. So for standard EFM, you measure the amplitude and the phase of this signal um, as it goes. And you can treat that just as you would if a, a Fourier transform of a, um, a wave signal and watching how it moves back and forth and its height is the amplitude and the phase shift. But as we drive DC bias, we set the amplitude, which you can now see in the lower left corner of the screen, to zero by making that omega term zero by applying DC bias to the tip, and then we measure the Kelvin force probe. Once again, this is known as amplitude modulated KPFM. We're now going to take it even further, and we're going to go to sideband Kelvin force probe. So let's take a brief intermission. What is the information that we're after? Well, we're after the actual potential at the surface. As you can see here, this is a test sample we like to show. Um, it's very good for um, basically explaining the basic concepts, concepts here. This was taken with sideband, um, but I just like to use it as a KPFM reference here. As you can see, the sample itself is um, little fingers. Um, we can ground the two on the side in this case, and then we apply bias to the center. In the case of this specific image, we applied a positive bias on the forward sweep, which is that blue line you see in the um, measured potential versus position. Um, plot that you see there. And then on the backward, we went to negative two volts. You can see that we're able to measure that voltage um, fairly consistently for how much we apply. Uh, the sample itself is um, silicon, and then the fingers themselves are a gold titanium uh, mixture. And you can see where we grounded the two samples, the, the two fingers, you can see that they are at zero potential, which is what we want to see, right? And not only is this information useful to us, but um, we can tell whether or not a device is working in failure analysis, for example or we can tell you know, where the distribution of the charge is, we can tell what is what, and as I mentioned, we don't have to look at a phase or an amplitude with Kelvin force probe. We can tell exactly what's positive, what's negative, and we can go on from there. So now we're gonna run back through and then we're gonna go into what Sideman gives us. So once again, we're measuring a contact potential difference or a difference between the charge on the surface of the sample by driving a DC bias to, to counteract that. So when you have two materials and they're near each other, we model it as a capacitor. Why can we do this? That's because the tip and the sample are connected and the difference in their work function will cause certain buildup of charge on one end or on the tip or the sample regardless, and you'll have a potential difference there. So as mentioned, we model this as a capacitor. And this is the equation we saw earlier. Um, we've taken the derivative because this is now a force. Um, you can see that where I have the static deflection term, which is the A term we pointed out before, the vibration at omega and the vibration at two omega. Once again, Kelvin force probe, if we make the uh, potential and the tip at the same bias, we can cancel out the central term. So what I'll now show you is, if you see in the bottom, there's a Fourier transform of the waveform. You can see we have the mechanical signal on the far right. That is always there. As mentioned, we always get the topography with our electric signal. And then we have our two waveforms. We have omega and omega. When we cancel out the term in Kelvin force probe, we set the omega term, as you can see in the lower part, to zero. And by doing that, we're able to measure the actual potential charge at the surface. I'll pause briefly so that you guys look at this. But that is the main goal, and that's how we're able to measure the signal. Once again, this is amplitude modulated Kelvin force probe. I did mention briefly, though, that this term contains a couple of things. One, it contains the surface potential, but it also contains a capacitance term. You'll also see that in the equation I have presented, there is a derivative with respect to the capacitance. That term is going to be important. It seems harmless right now, but for sideband, that is going to be causing a bit of an offset and a lack of sensitivity, which we are going to further improve on. 
So instead of a test sample, let's look at this. This is a cycled coin battery cell. It's a lithium graphite based. And as you can see on the left, we have the topography image, and then we have the sideband KPFM potential. As this battery has been uh, cycled quite a lot, um, the topography, well, if you image this before it's cycled, you won't see much of a distribution. It'll just be a large conductor as it's mainly graphite. But as you can see, there are regions of lighter um, potential in image B, which is the KPFM potential. And that means that there's, for some reason, there's some charged particles that have built up. And um, that's very useful to see what the underlying structure is, because just looking at the topography, you wouldn't be able to tell if those underlying elements, so they could be like a lithium compound or something like that, um, built up there. Whatever it is, they're at a higher potential than the surrounding background, and they don't match directly with the topography. That's a very good example of that. But let's go back to the math. So we want to look more at this capacitance term. So the derivative of the capacitance is there. And we're still able to get very good images from um, amplitude modulated KPFM, but we want to make it better. So what we're going to do is we're going to tailor expand the capacitance term. So when you do that to k equal one, um, you get two terms for the force. You get the k equal zero term, which is, as you can see highlighted in blue, you have this constant A naught. And then in your k equal one term, you have this a one term. We'll talk about that in a second. But as we've expanded this term, we're basically we're looking at it. And it seemed harmless before, but what if we could get rid of it? So what the main advantage to sideband is instead of locking onto the off resonance or the amplitude modulated peak, as we see on the far left of the Fourier transform at the bottom, now we're going to lock onto these two side peaks that are on either side of our mechanical distribution. So the initial peak in the center that you see on the right is still our mechanical term, but on the sides, we get these two um, almost identical peaks that appear on either side. So what happens if we use these two to measure, to drive our DC bias to the tip and use that feedback instead of using that omega term we were setting to zero before? Well, it turns out this gives us what is known as sideband KPFM. So this is what sideband KPFM is. It's about locking onto these two sidebands, hence the name, and from that, what is the big benefit? Well, it's these terms here that you see. So, the cantilever itself is usually coated completely in a gold or a platinum surface. And it turns out that that A0 A term from our expanded derivatives with respect to capacitance um, has contributions from not only the tip of the cantilever, which is what we're using to image the sample, what we're using to pick up the charge distribution, it also has terms from the back of the cantilever. It has terms from um, the cone of the cantilever, et cetera. And we don't need all of that. Right? So if we look at the A1 term, this term happens to be such that, as you can see from the plot on the left here, the tip cone and the tip cantilever terms, or sorry, yeah, the tip cone and the back of the cantilever terms, or the non-local interaction, basically become non-existent which means that all the information that we're getting is directly from the tip itself, right? Right at the end of it, where it's measuring the sample. And that's where we want to get the highest resolution. And that's why this technique is so useful. To reiterate. Okay. Oh, I guess you guys didn't see all of that. So this is the slide, I'll let this sit here. Um, I didn't advance it, sorry about that. So this to reiterate, so we have our off resonance peak, that's that blue one that we're seeing on the left. That's originally what we were targeting and we were setting to zero. Now we have these two sidebands and we have not only a local interaction instead of the total interaction from the cantilever and we've gotten rid of the capacitance term effectively, which means that we'll get higher resolution in theory. And to prove that, here's an example of another KPFM image. This is taken sideband as well. Uh, this is boron nitride on monolayer graphene. And the first thing we did was we did a lithography process. If you're not familiar with that, that means that you use the tip instead of scanning back and forth as you would with an AFM image. You can scan basically in a line, push a particle around, or in this case, we apply bias to the tip and we can cut shapes into 2D materials. This is very useful for nanofabrication, for example. And in this case, we've cut two 350 nanometer little squares out of it. And then afterwards, we image it with sideband. 
And as you can see, there's a difference in the potential charge and that lights up very well on the uh, KPFM potential side. And we're getting very, very high resolution with this laterally as well as vertically. This image itself is one and a half by one and a half microns as well. So it's very, very tiny little um, structure we've created. So now that we've covered all of this, we we found that um, we are we're trying to um, keep the potential difference between the surface and the sample. Um, we're canceling it out, and that's how we're measuring a potential difference. That's Kelvin force probe. And then we found a way to make it uh, more sensitive with sideband KPFM by locking onto these sideband peaks. But there's one more thing that we need to consider, and that's the cantilever itself. So the other way to get higher um, lateral resolution or vertical resolution, we find, is to look at the cantilever itself. An AFM cantilever is just a spring. And you can see here how you calculate the spring constant itself is just based on the Young's modulus of the material, its length, its width, and its thickness, assuming the cantilever is rectangular and its width is much less than its length. Let's look at this a little bit deeper. All of the, the vibrations that we've been tracking with the lock and amplifiers, with the, ampli with the um, resonance peaks, et cetera, have all been based on the cantilever itself vibrating. And that means that if you put a softer cantilever, we would assume um, that the cantilever would vibrate more based on the same interaction, depending on how it so we have to look at the sensitivity itself. And it turns out the AFM or the EFM amplitude sensitivity, so not necessarily the sensitive to the mechanical or the topography, but we're looking specifically at the electrical sensitivity of the cantilever. It's based on the amplitude and then the tip bias that we're driving it or the changes in those two. And that means that's basically how much the cantilever is deflecting based on what electrical signal it's picking up. So if we write out the mat, the math. So we're going to call this quantity X, which is the amplitude of the oscillation. And we're going to substitute in that electric force, which is that cross term that we were talking about. You see the capacitance derivative there as well. And when we look at this, we can see that the cantilever, it's dependent on this electric force term, but also based on the quality factor of the cantilever as well as the spring constant. So spring constant is the first one. So that's rather intuitive. We would assume a softer cantilever, if you apply a field to it, would bend more. So that's already fairly intuitive. But this quality factor, if instead we substitute in the displacement we measure on the position-sensitive photo detector. So an AFM feedback loop works by bouncing a laser off of a cantilever to a position-sensitive photo detector. So that's how we're measuring how much the cantilever bounces. If you substitute in those terms, you'll see that instead of being dependent on a quality factor, we're dependent on the length of the cantilever. You notice that the spring constant and the length of the cantilever are both in the denominator. So therefore, we would want a short and soft cantilever, ideally. Now, this is fairly contradictory, as usually the, um, the shorter you make it, the um, as we saw before, um, it's not completely intuitive, but um, a softer, shorter cantilever, ideally, in theory, will help you. So now I have to back this up, right? So here are two images. This is on um, a sample that it, it's it's small little um, fluorinated carbon fluorinated um, features. They're very small. It's F14H20, and these little features give out their own bias, which is the nice thing is we don't have to apply a sample bias. This has an inherent bias to it. I'm showing the work functions on the side, as you can calculate the work function. Um, from KPFM, which is one of the main reasons it was um, originally introduced. But as you can see here on the top, we scan with a off resonance KPFM sideband, and we're getting the higher resolution there. So this is showing, um, as I mentioned, those off resonance peaks that we were using can give us, basically you can see that the image on the um, right is much clearer, it's much more defined, and it's much sharper. Right? And you can see some of the features in between over the same imaging area. And then further, if we make the cantilever itself softer, so I'm comparing a NSC-14 on the top versus an NSC-36. NSC-36 is a bit longer, but it is also a softer cantilever. And it's a little tough to see in this image, but notice that the topography is the same and the potential, their distributions look fairly similar. We're using sideband for both. But if you look closely here, 
On the left, you have the NSC image, and on the right, you have the NSC14. Um, NSC14 is a harder cantilever, and based on what I showed you before, we would assume that it has less lateral sensitivity based on the equation I showed you before. And as you can see, inside of that darker region, you can see there's small little um, pockets of higher potential, and they're much sharper. But now we're, we're, we're nitpicking um, pretty hard here um, with the potential here. But the point is, is that you're able to not only get um, the resolution from locking into the sideband peaks, which is why we use sideband, but also with the cantilever itself, you can get higher resolution as well. So with that, we'll just talk about some highlights here. So we had to dive pretty deep fairly quickly and we had to cover a lot of what the background to KPFM is. And once you get down to the end of it, um, we're doing a measurement that gives us the potential difference at the surface and gives us the distribution. How you do that is you drive a DC bias based on the surface potential to the tip along with your AC bias. And how you do that is the difference between amplitude modulated, for example, frequency modulated, which we didn't cover, or sideband KPFM. And the way in which you modulate these with the lock and amplifier is why you have the different techniques. Sideband KPFM, as I've showed you in several images, and I hope uh, came across pretty clearly, is a technique that allows you to measure the surface potential with very high sensitivity and clear lateral resolution. And in addition to that, if you want to push it further, also pay attention to the cantilever that you use, and um, you'll be able to map out these potential charges quite well and give yourself a lot of information at the nanoscale. So I hope that was good for everyone. And for now, I'll take questions, Gil. Great. Thanks again for a great presentation, Ben. I'd like to remind everyone, uh, as if you have a question, uh, please enter them in your uh, field uh, in, the in the webinar uh, menu. Uh, and we'll take a few questions as we have time. Um, we have one question that just came in. Mm -hmm. uh, if I can read this out. Let's see, I have to expand this. Um, so it's rather long. <laughs> OK. Um, it's about the sidebands. Uh, instead of using the amplitude of the first sidebands, uh, you can also mm -hmm. use uh, the magnitude of the frequency shift caused by the frequency modulation of the mechanical resonant frequency of the cantilever by the applied AC bias and the corresponding electrical field acting on the lever. Uh, this frequency shift is also proportional to the second gradient of the capacitance or force gradient. What is the benefit of tracking the amplitude of the sidebands instead of the magnitude of the frequency shift or the traditional FM, KPFM? Ah, okay. So the, the main difference, um, at least from a technique standpoint and from a scanning perspective, is that um, uh, when you do the frequency modulated, obviously, yeah, your, your frequency modulated as compared to like amplitude modulated will give you higher sensitivity because you're picking it up. Um, as to this, um, based on the terms we were showing here, um, I'm arguing that um, we are getting rid of some of the um, cross terms from the cantilever itself, um, such as, you know, electric interaction from the back of the cantilever, from the cone of the cantilever, et cetera. And so you won't have those terms um, included into your data as well. I think that answers that. Great. Thanks, Ben. Uh, another question that just came through. Uh, what cantilever did, was used for the KPFM measurements on the boron nitride on a single layer of graphene uh, image? Let's see if I have that written down. I believe it was an NSC14, if I'm not mistaken. Sorry, I have a little lag here with my slides, so let me. Um, I could look that up for you if you send me an email later, but I believe it's an SC14 cantilever. Certainly. Um, another question, uh, is there any complementary characterization techniques uh, necessary uh, in addition to sideband band KPFM for complete analysis of the material? So this is a little bit, um, I think, a open-ended question, but can you think of other complementary uh, material characterization techniques? Um, well, a, a great um, example of that is um, what we show and I have on the screen right now is using it with uh, nano bias based lithography. Um, additionally, the, the work function calculation that um, is attempted with this kind of a measurement is also complementary to it um, as well as, yeah, so I think, yeah. 
Yeah, I think we see sometimes other AFM techniques that we do in addition to KPFM are like conductive AFM measurements sometimes. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes even for semiconductors, SCM, scanning capacitance microscopy. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I have myself just a general question in comparison to some of the other K KPFM modes. Uh, the side by end KPFM, what, what, how do you compare like the applied AC bias magnitude? Is it lower uh, or higher? In my experience, I usually drive about the same um, one or two volt AC bias to the tip. Um, I haven't noticed much of a difference myself. Okay. Uh, and some couple more questions coming in through. Um, could you comment on the effect of the main resonance peak distortion on the cantilever on sideband KPFM measurements? Ah, um, so as I mentioned um, very briefly in the beginning, um, two-pass EFM techniques were the original. And sometimes um, we still keep that option around is that if the surface itself is very rough, it can be useful to use um, two-pass technique even with sideband so that um, if your surface is very rough and the um, mechanical um, waveform is interfering on with your two sidebands, then you sometimes want to go back to that um, older way of doing it, or the other way of doing it, um, just so that if you do have some kind of an interaction between the two, you can um, negate or um, reduce that effect. Great. Uh, another question that just came through the line, um, what is the smallest detectable voltage with the sideband technique? Uh, that that a little bit dependent on the cantilever. A great way to try that um, is to take a piece of uh, HOPG or a highly organized polygraphite, I believe. And um, you can, because it's just a good conductor, you can actually try that yourself. So while you scan, um, you apply a little more, a little more, a little more bias and see what the smallest change you can see in that is. And as you scan it, it'll do the little um, bias steps and then you just take a cross section of it. Um, I, I've gone under a tenth of a volt if I remember properly. So, but it's very high. It's very very sensitive. So, um, so another general question about tip selection: um, What is the lower limit? How soft of tips AFM probes can you use with a KPFM? You know, uh, it just depends on what, yeah, it depends what you can find. I, the the gold itself has to be a coating around it, so you're already fighting that, unless you have like a solid, like or a diamond cantilever. Um, soft as you can go. I would say like oscillation techniques, probably the FM type, so 2.8 newtons per meter. Yeah, can you go can you oscillate lower. That would make sense. Yeah. Um, what, are, what are the effects of like environment in general, environment, things like humidity, temperature on, on the KPFM measurement? Mm. The, the humidity I worry more about for was like bias lithography measurements or like cutting or something like that, um, if I were to do something like that. But with KPFM, um, minimal as far as I can tell. So I would say uh, obviously you get more sensitivity in a vacuum environment. Because uh, mm -hmm. you remove that, uh, you remember you're measuring always the work potential difference between the tip, whatever's in between, and the surface, yeah. right? So sandwich. So you know, if it's high humidity, you're going to have a very large uh, moisture layer, uh, which is essentially a dielectric. So I, I think you, you, a drier environment. Oh, you're yeah, if you can do it in a vacuum, that's good. Yeah. All right, I think uh, that's it for all the questions in our line. Um, I think if there are any further questions, please send emails. Uh, to either our inquiry uh, email address, inquiry at parksystems.com, or uh, you can actually reach Ben or myself directly at ben at uh, parksystems.com. Um, I appreciate everyone's attendance. I hope you enjoyed today's session. Please be on the lookout for our next uh, webinar series. And at this point, uh, please enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you very much. Thank you.